Welcome to the video, The New Therapeutic Milieu. Wake up to the new therapeutic environment. My name is Dr. Stephen Bacon. I'm a clinical psychologist in Santa Barbara, California, and I've spent the past decade writing books and researching exactly how psychotherapy works. It's a new world out there. The most obvious difference is that standard therapists assume they are operating in fundamental reality, and the medical model is a useful, universally true paradigm. In truth, we are operating in constructed reality, and the medical model consistently leads us down the wrong path. The training and experience research results have surprising implications about how easy it is to succeed with most clients and how hard it is to be effective with challenging clients. In addition, new discoveries from behavioral genetics radically confront old assumptions about diagnoses, psychopathology, and how to sustain change. Essentially, these discoveries completely refute the medical model. Knowing what part of the client's life is constructed and what part is fixed is of central importance in case conceptualization and in terms of sustaining gains. For most people, change is ridiculously easy. The therapy outcome literature hides an important finding that is critical to understand when it comes to enhancing outcomes. Put simply, most clients find it easy to change. To be more specific, psychotherapy has a stable positive effect size of 0.8, which can be operationalized as treated clients are better off than 80% of a waiting list control group. When framed as a percent improved, which is a different statistic, one can estimate that approximately 55% of clients improve in psychotherapy and 45% are either unchanged, become worse, or drop out. The research shows that it is ridiculously easy to achieve this 55% result. Beginners can accomplish it, paraprofessionals can accomplish it, and non-therapists can accomplish it. Moreover, every system invented and practiced also achieves this 55% level of success. In this sense, the 55% might be characterized as the readily adaptable group. Implications of the 55%. This group changes so easily that one could argue that they are able to evolve simply on request. Essentially, they can resolve their issues whenever they are approached by a reasonably credible therapist with a reasonably credible rationale. This ease of change has a number of implications for psychotherapy. First, it virtually guarantees that any new psychotherapy system will work and help people. This ease of change group validates every new approach. This explains the success of classic systems like psychodynamic psychotherapy, but also explains more unusual systems like Primal Scream and EMDR. Second, this ease of change group is responsible for the general sense among psychotherapists that they are personally successful. The average therapist is essentially guaranteed to be effective with the 55%. Moreover, their personal effectiveness quotient appears even higher when we think through how many of the 45% present themselves as poor therapy candidates. Put another way, experienced therapists recognize that a certain percentage of their referrals are unsuited for psychotherapy. When these people are eliminated, many therapists have the understandable feeling that they are successful with 70% or 75% of their real clients. The ease of the 55% can confuse therapists. While these numbers are helpful for therapist self-esteem, the downside is that they make therapists complacent and disguise the fact that there are no training or experience effects and that psychotherapy is stuck with outcomes that have failed to improve for at least 40 years. Most importantly, there's an implication that the medical model is working and that the system or systems that one is using are the cause of the improvement. When what I do actually works, why make radical changes? It's easy to imagine an identical argument 
being proposed by the shamanic healers who use exorcisms. The 55% and the fluidity of constructed reality. A more important contribution of the Ease of Change group has to do with understanding and feeling the fluidity implicit in constructed reality. Accepting that most clients change easily with virtually any rationale suggests that psychopathology and its solutions and resolutions exist in such a malleable psychological space that they can be changed by a word, an idea, or a feeling. In this sense, it can be useful to picture psychotherapeutic reality as so constructed and so fluid that it operates in an almost magical realm where dilemmas are created by curses and the evil eye and resolved by healers and sorcerers. From this perspective, one might argue that some of the shamanic metaphors better describe the feeling of the constructed reality of psychotherapy than the medical model's scientific metaphors. The 45%, exploring the implications of the ease of change of the 55% inevitably leads us to examine the 45% who fail to benefit from therapy. The first implication is that the only way to improve therapeutic outcomes is to succeed with the 45%. The 55% are already in the bag for most therapists. Common sense argues that the 45% are composed of clients who are hyperstable or prone to decline because they have more negative personal and life factors. For example, they are more traumatized, have fewer resources, have current disabilities, use dysfunctional social strategies, and so on. They clearly have more negative genetic factors. In addition, it can be assumed that the 45% have ways of resisting and defeating the typical strategies that work with the 55%. This suggests that success with this group requires doing something different. The constructionist therapist who has recognized that standard psychotherapeutic interventions, case conceptualizations, diagnoses, and prognoses are all constructions is in an ideal position to create that something different experience. Recent contributions from behavioral genetics. Following an understanding of the 55%, the next major determinant of a changed therapeutic milieu arises from recent findings in the area of behavioral genetics. The initial hopes arising from decoding the human genome were repeatedly dashed as behavioral geneticists were unable to discover a combination of genetic factors that effectively predicted important outcomes like intelligence, depression, or schizophrenia. That changed around 2015 when the introduction of large sample sizes and GWAS statistical procedures revealed that most complex variables were determined by 2,000 to 4,000 genetic variations, each of which contributed a very small amount to the total effect size. Using these GWAS analyses generates polygenic scores, scores that meaningfully predict important outcomes like anxiety or alcoholism. In addition, using these new polygenic scores researchers are beginning to be able to measure different nature-nurture effects. For example, they are beginning to generate new insights into the immediate and long-term effects of factors like the family and schooling. Surprising results regarding the medical model. Genetic research shows that the medical model is all wrong when it comes to psychological problems. What we call disorders are merely the extremes of the same genes that work throughout the normal distribution. That is, there are no genes for any psychological disorder. Instead, we have many of the DNA differences that are related to disorders. The salient question is how many of these we have. The genetic spectrum runs from a few to a lot, and the more we have, the more likely we are to have problems. Essentially, the genetic research reveals that there are no discrete disorders. For example, it is inaccurate to claim that one person has schizophrenia and another is normal. Instead, we are all on the same continuum. In that sense, we are all schizophrenic to a degree, and no one has schizophrenia. Plowman believes that this is true for all psychiatric diagnoses. They are all continuums, and we are all on the spectrum for everything. 
The implication is that our symptoms emerge and disappear due to random environmental factors. While some individuals at the extremes of the bell curve may appear to be permanently psychotic or depressed or anxious, it is more accurate to see most sufferers as individuals whose symptoms are likely to remit by themselves as the effect of the environmental factor decreases and they regress to a non-symptomatic norm. Only three diagnoses. Moreover, using multivariate analysis, the geneticists have determined that there is a global score for mental health and three basic subcategories, neuroticism, externalizing behaviors, and psychosis. The over 300 diagnoses in DSM-5 should be reduced to three. Another important implication of the abnormal is normal finding is that we cannot cure a disorder because there is no disorder. Success in treatment should be viewed quantitatively as the degree to which a problem is alleviated. These findings fit well with the research that divided psychotherapy's privileged knowledge into privileged knowledge, elaborations taught in graduate school and useless for better outcomes, and common knowledge, often useful in terms of better outcomes. The concepts that there is no cure and no actual disorder is very significant for constructionism and will be explored in more detail at a later time. Environment versus genetics. Unfortunately for parents, educators, and psychologists, the genetic findings about interventions are rather discouraging. Essentially, a good environment will have a positive effect while you're in that environment. However, when you leave that environment, for example, when you leave a good family or a good school, your functioning tends to move back to your genetic mean. Put another way, you can get a bump up from good experiences and a bump down from bad ones, but over time those bumps are not sustained. That's good news for the traumatized. They will tend to revert back to their norms when the trauma is withdrawn, but bad news for those who have positive experiences. The positive effects are not self-sustaining. For psychotherapy, that implies that we can create a positive bump up through our interventions, but many current assumptions exemplified by ideas like, I help the client remove maladaptive cognitions and ineffective life strategies and replace them with healthier self-sustaining strategies. This will allow them to be better over time are essentially unsupported. Sustaining change. Paige Harden, another behavioral geneticist, offers a helpful metaphor that has relevance for psychotherapists. If we have a genetic predisposition for poor eyesight, this problem can be corrected by healthy structure, eyeglasses. Similarly, if our clients change and we can help them find or create structures that sustain the changes, a great marriage partner, a good job, a healthy community, then there is a much better chance of long-term success. This recommendation is similar to the Buddhist idea of the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha refers to the hope instilled by the concept that a real human achieved inner peace. The Dharma is the teachings that outline the path, and the Sangha is the community of fellow practitioners who support each other. The Buddhists believe that sustained progress is impossible without all three. The geneticists see the Sangha as an example of the kind of structure that might be able to sustain an upward bump. The fixed factors. This last factor, structure, is central to constructionism because the constructionist is aware that while psychological reality is fluid, the facts of a client's life, for example, an alcoholic husband or racism, are relatively fixed. In that sense, the constructionist is always hyper aware of the impact of these fixed factors, as those are the ones that limit change and fluidity. These are the same factors that can create helpful or hurtful structures. The geneticists essentially see the environment as a random mixture of positive and negative effects. Put another way, the environment is seen as the source of human suffering, and the three psychiatric factors, neuroticism, externalizing problems, and psychosis, limit our capacity to adapt to this suffering. Good scores imply that we adapt well to the negative life events. Poor scores imply the opposite. Meaning-making. 
Humans make sense of their suffering via explanations. The new genetic findings can be interpreted as arguing that suffering isn't purposeful. Rather, it is a result of the genetic lottery, the individual's genetic capacity or incapacity to adapt to life's challenges. But Plowman argues over and again that the genetic predisposition is not destiny. Quote, heritability describes what it is but does not predict what could be, as I have emphasized several times. High heritability of weight does not mean there is nothing you can do about your weight, nor does heritability mean that we must succumb to our genetic propensities to depression, learning disabilities, or alcohol abuse. Genes are not destiny. You can change. Plowman's conclusion reemphasizes the centrality of meaning-making. Put another way, it is only by working with meanings, narratives, and explanations that the human experience can be made better or worse. The genetics are relatively fixed. As always, the universe of constructions is wide open. In helping define what is fixed, genetics has paradoxically highlighted the importance of working with what is mobile and changeable. In this sense, constructionism stands alone in that it is the only paradigm that is completely focused on discerning what is fundamental and solid and what only appears to be. And of course, it specializes in how to use that discernment to minimize suffering and maximize well-being. Conclusion The constructionist lives in a different reality than the standard therapist. Most importantly, given that they see so many apparently solid factors as constructed, reality is much more fluid and malleable. The behavioral genetics research has made significant contributions to these concepts. Paradoxically, given that genetics are the ultimate fixed factor, it is significant that a number of the new findings promote fluidity and deconstruction. The continuum mode and the understanding that none of us are actually mentally ill profoundly challenges the medical model. The importance of genetic influence disputes the centrality of personal and systemic explanations for suffering. And the focus on working with structure to sustain gains reorganizes the goals of psychotherapy. Finally, constructionism agrees with the geneticists that there are no disorders. Most importantly, constructionism welcomes the genetic evidence refuting the medical model. While the training and experience research have already demolished the model's credibility, it is so hardy and so entrenched in Western thought that the genetic contributions to its refutation are welcome and supportive. Finally, integrating the findings about the 55% allows therapists to experience the fluidity of the therapeutic milieu while simultaneously running into the seemingly immovable wall of the 45%. The 45% convince us that we need to do something different to succeed, and constructionism is all about freedom, creativity, and doing something different.